Ja. Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. Christ the Lord is risen today. Yep. For our, uh, before we get started, if you'll uh, uh, look at the board there, a few announcements there. I guess moving on down there to the third one, the fourth one, uh, make, a, make a note on your calendar that. Uh, the 4th of May, we will be going to uh, Camp Adventure uh, for a cleanup day before the camp opens, so keep that in mind. Are there any other announcements from the floor? Seeing none, we'll light the candles and have it light and uh, start the service.
Let me have the babies. Come on, children. Sharp trips, fellas. Like everybody come clean today, just clean. <laughs> Mr. Cool. Mm-mm-mm. You want to sit up? Good sir. Hey, brother. Hey, you see, I'll sit wherever you want. Spike. 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 I used to give this to certain students in my classroom. Good call, Mom and Dad. Come on down, princess. My girls, look at y'all just, somebody take pictures. Good night. That's right, take pictures while they're clean. What, <laughs> what is today? It's Easter. Well, that was a couple of days ago. That was a good Friday. You're close, but what, what, what happened on Easter? Why did we celebrate Easter? Because Jesus rose from the dead. You're absolutely right. You know what? There's something, uh, sometimes people say that, it, well, there's something that said when Christ died, he conquered death, right? But when he rose, he rose so that you can arise with him. So this season, as you're upstairs with your class, as you go throughout the week, I want you to think about that. That he rose from the dead, but because he rose, I can rise. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this time, these kids, these sharp-dressed kids. I pray that as they go upstairs with Sherry and Mindy, Lord, that they, um, that they see you in a way that they have never seen you. And as we big kids worship down here, Lord, that we see you in a way that we've never seen you, no matter how long we've been walking with you, no matter how many times we've read the Bible. I pray that you come alive in us today beyond our imagination. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Y'all can go with your... Said he won his mommy. Y'all are so patient through the chaos. I'm so glad to hear that chaos. And I'm sure there's many of you who are glad to hear that in this church again. Happy Easter, everybody. All right, now that I know that you got, you got some gump and you got some vocal cords on you, I want to do something a little different. I want you, instead of me asking you and trying to pull out where you saw God, I want you to take 15 minutes and tell God what you're thankful for. In this Easter season, let's not let this Easter be just another holiday season that we go through the motions of checking it off our list. Let's anticipate meeting with Jesus today. Take about 15 seconds, then I'm going to have another request of you. Take 15 seconds and thank God. Tell him what you're thankful for. Amen. Amen. 
we this morning we're talking about some disciples that followed Jesus that we don't hear much about and they followed him out of with a heart of gratitude and it was women and they followed Jesus with a heart of gratitude this Easter season let's have a heart of gratitude now the next request I have is I want you to pray over each other the people that you're with no more than groups of three I want you to pray God's blessing over each other's life and his vision over your life and over the life of this church so you can get in groups and pray for each other please and I'll come in with the uh, Lord's Prayer Don't be bashful. God wants to hear from you. He doesn't he didn't need to just he doesn't want to just hear from the pastor. So I need to hear some voices. Be praying over each other. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this passes as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, before I read the scripture, I, I think I missed the punchline. <laughs> I hope I don't kill your sermon here. But this morning, we were asked, how much you've pr prepared this morning for Easter Sunday? And I kind of caught me off guard because I don't think I've prepared any different than today than the other 62 Easter's. Maybe I just showed up. I don't, I don't, I don't know my per, per, what my per, uh, preparation was supposed to be. But along that line, you usually ask, have we seen God? Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to share a little story with you before I read the scripture. My mom called. Her kitchen sink wouldn't work, was, was plugged. Okay, mine's not going down very fast either. I'll get some Drano, I'll be down. So I dumped it in mine. It said, put it in there. After 15 minutes, rush it down with some hot water, and it'll work. Worked on mine, and it seemed like it worked. So I went down to my mom's. It was just barely going, so I dumped it. Dump a fifth of the thing in, it says. 
Follow with hot water, I think with a cup or a quart. Wait 15 minutes and rinse it down with some hot water. Now it wouldn't go down at all. And so I said, now I'm going to do this a second time. And I told my mom, I said, it says, do not plunge. So I said, in 30 minutes, I probably may not be here, put some hot water on it. It'll work, but don't plunge it. Okay, she said. It just so happened that I was around there lingering longer in a little bit. And I said, I'll put the hot water on it. It still wouldn't go down. It was worse than it was before. I said, get me the plunger. <laughs> she said, do not plunge. I said, get me the plunger. <laughs> Finally, after plunging, it's worked and it's worked ever since. I guess I need to back up a little bit. Before I said, give her the plunger, she's back here and says, said something about maybe we ought to pray about it or something like that. And I think I'm telling her, I said, <clears throat> God's got wars to fight. He's got cancer and this and that. He's not worrying about going to worry about our drains. <laughs> That's when I said, well, give me the plunger. And so when I got the plunger and it worked, later on I wondered, maybe I don't give God credit for everything he does. Was it really the plunger or was it God? I mean, my mom, she's kind of into this praying in the circumstances. And, I, and so I'm... That was, that was the whole crutch of my story was uh, when something happens this week, uh, stop and think, was that really me? What I did? Or was that something God did? And he did it just for me? All of the things going on in the world, all the wars, the fight, the cancers and everything, and he had time to help me do that? Now think about that a little bit. Our scripture today comes from uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses uh, 50 to 57. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perish inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishables must, be, must clothe themselves with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortal. When the perishable have been clothed with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has swallowed up, has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us victories through our Lord Jesus Christ. Easter Sunday. It's one of those Sundays where you sit back and you wonder as a pastor, all right, how many different ways can I retell the Easter message? I'm only on year 27 of retelling these stories. And yet it blows my mind how God shows up in unique ways to say, hey, what about? At the end of the service, we're going to have an opportunity to put flowers on that cross. And we put flowers on that cross because we as Christians reclaim the gift that was given. And we say to the world, what you intended for evil, what you intended for destruction, has become a banner for us to wave. It's become a, a way for us to stand up and to proudly declare, we follow a Savior who loved us so much that death on a cross was not something to be avoided, but rather something to voluntarily walk up to. And then the idea that death on that cross did not have the final say. Did you ever ask yourself this question, who in the world ever rents a tomb? Because Jesus, in essence, rented a tomb because he knew that he wasn't going to be there long. 
He knew that there was going to come a moment where he was going to walk back out of that tomb. And, and I love when you read that passage because the writer reminds us that Jesus was so calm, cool, and collected that he even folded the linen that was over him. Now, I don't know if that's because he feared his mama when he got out for not making his bed. Or was it that he was just saying, you know what, I've got this. I know what's going to take place because not only have I now conquered sin and death, not only do I hold the keys of hell and of death and of life, but everything has been set right. Everything in that moment had been rearranged and God had the final victory in this. You see, we've been talking about what does it mean to say, I believe? And we've been talking about the, the creeds of the church and specifically the creed of the Korean United Methodist Church. And as we went through it, we talked about, I believe in the Holy Scriptures and, and I believe that God gave those to us as a way of, of teaching and growing. And I believe that God is a God of creation and, and that God gave us this gift of creation. I believe in the Holy Spirit as the power that allows us to do all that we can do. I believe Jesus Christ came and, and lived and died and rose again for us, but I'm here to tell you that if you can't speak the last line of this creed, then don't speak the rest of it. And that is, I believe in the final victory. You see, too many times we Christians act like there's so much in this world that we have to fear. There's so much in this world that we have to shy away from and, and so much in this world we have to avoid. And yet Jesus says, I've conquered all of it. I've conquered every last piece of it. You see, when he hung on the cross, he hung on the cross for your sin. He hung on the cross for your divorce. He hung on the cross for your depression. He hung on the cross for all of the garbage of your life. He hung on the cross for those moments when you were terrified and didn't know which way to go. He hung on the cross to let you know that no matter what the world says about you, one thing they have to claim, and that is you are a child of God. They can claim whatever they want, but it always ends with, and this is a child of God. We have been called by Christ to a relationship. A relationship that God knew at the start of, of creation that there was going to come a moment where he was going to have to come and to set things right. God sent the prophets and he sent, he sent the priests. He sent the law. He sent everything trying to bring us back to the relationship with him. Trying to say that a relationship with him is what life is all about. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter the title that you have on this planet. It doesn't matter what car you drive or how big your house is. What matters is, do you know Jesus Christ? Because when you know Jesus Christ in that moment, you receive the final victory. You receive that final victory. We've got the baptismal font out, and someone said, well, who's getting baptized? And I said, we all are. Come on, grab that side. Because when we were baptized, we were baptized into the life, death, and the resurrection of Christ Jesus. When we were baptized, we took on the claim, we took on as heirs, co-heirs with Jesus, all that he had gone through. And yet somehow we got this image that when we accept Jesus Christ, that's all supposed to be peaches and cream from here on out. I don't know about you, but my life has been anything but peaches and cream. There have been days where I've sat back and wondered, what on earth is going on? There have been days where I've sat back and said, really, Jesus, you want me to be a pastor? I think I would rather sell used cars. And I should have taken the other pill. <laughs> and yet, what I recognize is that when Jesus calls us, he calls us for a purpose. And there are going to be moments in that call that you're going to sit back and you're going to think, what in the world is this all about? Why in the world is X, Y, or Z happening to me? I don't understand it. And yet Jesus simply whispers in our ear, trust me, trust me. He whispers in our ear when we, when we even walk up to the very moment where we're facing death and he says, trust me, step on over. You're good. You've got this. But he also trusts him with something else. You see, when Jesus died on the cross... And he took your sin and my sin and the sin of every human being that has ever existed with him. He not only 
faced the pain and the agony. He not only faced the Roman half-death when he was beaten. He didn't only face the fact that his friends had abandoned him. He didn't only face the fact that the religious authorities, rather than help him to experience God's love, chose to kill him because they were terrified of him. He had to face the fact that people walking by him mocked him. He had to face the fact that the political authorities that were meant to protect him crucified him because they were terrified of what public opinion might say. Thank God things have changed so much in our world. And yet, when he died on the cross, something else took place. Because in that moment, when he breathed his last breath, Satan cheered. The demons were jumping up and down. They had finally gotten, uh, they'd finally won the battle. But the problem was they'd lost the war. Because in that moment, when Jesus breathed his last, a countdown began. A countdown began throughout heaven. And you could hear the Father reminding all of creation, I win. I win. And so Jesus took your sins, took your addictions, took your fears, took your frustrations, took your depression, took your anger, took your control, and laid it down in hell and said, these will no more bother my people. I'm going to separate them as far as east is from west. I'm going to allow them to experience freedom like they have never known before. And in the moment that Jesus came out of hell, the lock was unlocked. And the chains that currently bind you right now are no longer chains that bind you. But see, what we tend to do in our culture is we tend to say, now that I'm free, I'm going to pretend like none of that ever happened. I'm going to forget about it because if I remember it, then it might bring me down. And yet Jesus says, no, I'm going to let you keep your chain. The chain that once bound you now becomes a source of of glory, not for you, but for God. And so the scars that are part of your life now become moments where you can begin to recognize the people around you that struggle the same way you struggle. And now that chain that once bound you in that pit of addiction or that pit of depression or that pit of fear or that pit of anger now becomes a chain that you can throw into someone else's pit and say, I know the way out. I know how to get out of that. I know the one. And by the way, you can yell down in the bottom of the pit, the lock is no longer locked. Simply unhook it. You've been set free. And you've been set free, not just now, but throughout all eternity. That nothing but nothing can ever separate us from the love that we have in Christ Jesus. And we can proudly stand as sons and daughters of the Most High King and cry out, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Not my Savior for just this time, not just my Savior for just this spot, but my Savior forever. And he says, come, follow me. But there's something else that I think that happened. Because you see, King Jesus came out of that grave, and yet he didn't rush off to the, the authorities and say, I need my crown back. But rather he said to all of us, I need you to get your aprons on. I need you to take seriously the call that I've placed in you. I need you to get your apron on and I need you to go out and let people know who I am. Because when we go out, what we need to do is we need to recognize those scars that Jesus still had in his hands and in his side and his feet were there for a reason. They were there to remind us that though pain may come, it doesn't have the final say. You see, God brings healing, and he brings it to us in ways that will boggle our minds. And he said to you and I, do you trust it? Do you trust it? Because if you trust it, then you recognize that Jesus has final victory. He has final victory over relationships that are broken. He has final victory over the financial problem that you've been having. He has final victory over the fact that your relationship with your children may have deteriorated. He has final victory in your marriage. He has final victory in the church. He has final victory in our culture. Politicians can say what they want. They can lob grenades left, right, anywhere they want to go. And yet Jesus Christ still remains as the final victor over all of it. And he says, church, here's what we're going to do. 
He didn't say we're going to come into to gorgeous buildings and we're going to get all dressed up and, and we're going to worship for an hour and then we're going to go out and pretend like nothing's ever changed. What he said was, I want you to come in and I want you to lay all of your garbage on the altar. I've said it before and I'll say it again. We do not need Warden June Cleavers in the church. We do not need you fighting like cats and dogs all the way to church, looking at your children saying, one more word out of you. And you all know that you've said it. I heard it said to Anna this morning. <laughs> and then I watched my grandson. You need to pray for that little boy. He may not exist by the end of the day. <laughs> and yet, when his parents hit the door, you know what? Smiles were on their face as Braxton's hand was being held. I, his fingers were turning blue as mom was carrying him in. And yet, when I challenge people, stop acting like life's perfect. Stop acting like everything in your world is exactly the way it's supposed to be. Claim the fact that there are things in life that are messed up. Before our service at Leesburg, a friend of mine had a seizure. And we sat there and we helped him through a seizure. And I looked at him, I said, Jack, I know, I said, you know, there's no other way to put it, but seizures suck. I watched Anna seize and as I watched my friend seize, I had flashbacks. And I watched his dad loving on him, trying to help him through it. And I just sat there praying and I said, Lord, you have final victory over seizure. I have no idea what that's going to look like, but I'm trusting in you today, God, that this seizure is going to stop. And not just this one, but all of its friends, all of its cousins, all of its neighbors, all those that are coming, God, they need to go to hell. Because we're done. We're done. You see, I think we as Christians need to recognize that if we truly are redeemed sons and daughters of the Most High King, then it's time that we come in and just, just claim who we are. Come in and say, you know what, I'm a crackpot. I'm broken and here's my scars, here's the mistakes I've made, here's, here's the things that have gone wrong in my life and here's the spots that I would rather not show to anyone and yet Jesus says, let them fly proudly. Because in doing so, we say, Jesus, all the glory goes to you because I've never been able to set myself free. I spent eight years in my addiction, was unable to ever free myself. And yet Jesus, in July of 2001, did it in one fell swoop. I don't know how, but I can tell you this, that I know what freedom looks like. And I know what life looks like. And life looks a whole lot like that was then this is now, but I'm claiming this as part of me. And I'm going to throw my apron on and I'm going to say, you know what, there's some people out here that need to know that they're loved. What would it look like if the church became a church where we just claimed who we were, but more importantly also claimed who we are becoming? What would the church look like if we came in and we said, you know, I'm a flawed human being. I've made all kinds of mistakes, and yet, by the grace of God, I've been redeemed by his life, his death, and his resurrection. And I claim that with everything that I am. What would it look like if we took seriously our baptismal vows that said that I choose the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as my way? You do realize that the largest religious are the fastest religious growing group in the United States are the nuns. Those with no religious affiliation. And they're looking at the church and they're saying, you know what, you all put on a really pretty show on Christmas and Easter, and yet we don't see the change in you. You come out of there and you act just like the rest of us. Why am I going to give up a Sunday morning to go and to sit? And yet, when they meet someone who's real, when they meet someone who's honest, when they meet someone who's willing to say, here's the mistakes I've made and here's what God's done with it, they latch on. Our world is hungry for honest, open, authentic people. Our world is hungry for Jesus in you. So here's what we're going to do to close this service or to close this message. What I want to do is I want to leave a time for you to come up. If you want to, you can stop at the baptismal Stick your fingers in, make the sign of the cross on your forehead, and reclaim your baptismal vows. 
If you want to bypass, that's fine. But I'm asking that we all take time to put flowers on this cross, to reclaim it, and to say to the rest of our community, the rest of our culture, the rest of our world, we claim the victory that God gave us in Christ Jesus. And we choose to throw on our aprons, to lay down our crowns, and to say we're going to follow you, Jesus, wherever you lead. Come.
Before we leave, Steve has said that he and Roseanne have a surprise for people downstairs, so I invite you to go down. My challenge to you is let's go out and let's show this community what it means to be a redeemed son or daughter of the Most High King. Let's go out and show them Jesus in the way that we live and the way that we love. Grab your apron and let's go to work. Amen. <laughs>